Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our presentation for the day. I'm Mark Smith, Chair of the, Ch the uh, Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce's Business Adv Advocacy Committee. And I'd like to start off with a couple of thanks, if we could. First, thanks to our sponsor, Pavea, for hosting us today. And thanks, too, to Breaking Bread for the excellent meal and for hosting us as well. I'd like to point out several dignitaries in the audience today. First, we have Chairman Tom Wagner from Sheboygan County. <laughs> Vice Chairman George Mathenzi. Mathenzi. And a former Chairman, Roger Trustrudy. And of course, Administrator Adam Payne from the county as well. From Senator Grossman's office today, we have Alan Ott. And of course, our men of the hour today, <laughs> Senator Devin Lemahieu. <laughs> Representative Tyler Vorpegel. And Representative Terry Katzma. We're going to get right into the program today, and while the, our dignitaries are making their way up to the front, I'd like to also ask that the Business Advocacy Committee members, if you would, please raise your hands. And if you would, if you're a member of the audience today, if you have any interest in this program, additional programs you'd like to see, ideas for future programs, please talk to anyone who's raised their hand and let us know what your ideas are for future programs. We would love to hear your ideas. Quick announcement about upcoming chamber events. Wednesday, March 15th, there will be a focal point for praise active shooter training from 7.30 to 9 a.m. Tuesday, March 21st, Business After Hours, hosted by the Stephanie Weil Center and Women in Management from 5 to 7 p.m., being held at the Stephanie Weil Center. And please make note of this. This is sort of a, this is sort of a big change. Our next First Friday Forum is not going to be a Friday. Our next First Friday Forum is Monday, April 10th. It's going to be at the Blue Harbor Resort. Senator Ron Johnson will be speaking to us at the Blue Harbor Resort, Monday, April 10th. So please make note of that. The last thing that I would like to have is a housekeeping item. If you have any questions for our senator or our two representatives, please hold your, if you would, hold your questions to the end and there are notes of paper at your table for your use and writing down your questions so you don't forget. So with no further ado, please. Well, thank you. Um, I'm Terry Cosmo. Um, before, we start to, before we start today, I just wanted to give you a little story a lot of you have children, or you have grandchildren, you might be able to relate to this. There's an old superstition from the East that encourages parents to predict their child's future. Folk wisdom suggests that while the child is still a toddler, the parent should place on a table within the child's reach a bottle of wine, some money, and a Bible. If the little one walks up to the table and picks the Bible, you will probably follow a spiritual vocation, pastor, priesthood. If he picks up the bottle of wine, then, then hedonism is in the cards. And if he picks up the money, he'll probably be a business person or an entrepreneur. So the story is told of a new father eager to plan for his son's future who administered the test. He carefully positioned the three objects on the coffee table, watching eagerly which ones the little boy would pick. The little guy walked up to the table, surveyed everything, slowly reached out his hand for the Bible. Then he paused picked up the money as well, put it in the Bible, then he tucked the Bible under his arm, 
and took the bottle of wine in the other hand and toddled off with all three, struggling to maintain his balance. The little boy's grandfather stood over to the side, silently watching the whole scene unfold. When he saw the dismay on his own son's face, he said, this is bad news. He's going to become a politician. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> uh, I know many of you, but I don't know all of you. Uh, I just was elected to my second term. The area that I represent begins on the south by the uh, sheboygan Ozaki County line. The town of, of Sherman, town of Holland, town of Wilson, town of Lima, and then about three, about 60% of the city of Sheboygan and the city of Sheboygan Falls. And uh, prior to that, I served at, or worked at Hoosburg State Bank uh, for about 30 years. Uh, last serving as president of, of that. So this is a, a second career, a change of careers for me. And it's so, it's so much nicer being a second term than a freshman. When you're a freshman, you have no clue what's going on. Now when you're a second term, you know how it is when you start a job, you can at least ask some decent questions and you can have some influence. And uh, what I'm privileged to do is serve as chairman of the Financial Institutions Committee I'm serving as vice chair of the Ways and Means. I am on the Federalism and Interstate uh, Committee. Tyler can talk a little bit more about that. I'm on the Insurance Committee in the Housing and Real Estate and Workforce Development. Uh, so um, I'm very happy with the committee assignments. Also, I'm on the Building Commission and that um, uh, oversees all building projects in the state other than roads. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a significant budget. So. Uh, <coughs> A couple things that, that I was asked to comment on is the HOPE Agenda. The HOPE Agenda stands for Heroin, Opiates, Prevention, and Education. And this has gotten a lot of publicity, uh, obviously dealing with, with, the, with the problems that are occurring uh, statewide. It's not just a city problem, Dane County problem, Milwaukee County problem. Uh, this morning I, I spent an hour in Random Lake dealing with talking to a group of uh, parent who has an addicted son and uh, dealing with members of a, of a parish there to see if, if anything can be done with that. But uh, John Nygren uh, has chaired, has been uh, quite active in this um, initiative. Um, he's co-chair of the Joint Finance Committee. There's been um, numerous bills, I think about um, 17 bills were passed over the last four years dealing with, with the HOPE agenda. There's another 11 bills. Uh, the governor recently called a special session for, uh, for the addiction uh, going on. So that, that's a, a big focus of our, of our, of our work. Uh, the other subject that I was asked to just comment on is, is uh, Dodd-Frank. And, and again, Dodd-Frank is, is a federal issue like dealing with banking rules and um, with some of the changes occurring in the federal government, I believe the, the banking industry is, is excited that there's going to be less regulation. Uh, the problem with, with some of the abuses that occur in, in Arizona and in Florida and California, unfortunately, when, when the federal government makes rules, they also apply to Wisconsin, and that has certainly uh, hampered small banks and, and their ability to make loans and, and reach out on that. So there's not a lot we do on the state level with banking regulations, but uh, as Tyler may talk about too, we, we think there's going to be a trend toward, toward uh, some, a lot of those regulations going down to, to the states, and we are, we are excited about that. Uh, so with that, I'll just I'll, I'll, uh, pass the microphone. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Terry. Um, <clears throat> Maybe you gotta hold it closer. Maybe. Okay. Try that. Otherwise, maybe we'll go without because that might be better if you can just project. Okay. Well, if I gets too much of a problem, I'll change it up. Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Tyler Vorpago. <coughs> that didn't last long. <coughs> and I'm the state rep for the 27th Assembly District, Lake Terry. Uh, we both started in uh, 2014. Uh, with our, where we were first elected, so we're both starting uh, our second term. Uh, I live in Plymouth, 
and uh, represent the kind of communities. If you kind of draw a line along uh, 23, uh, Kohler, um, and then the north side of the city of Sheboygan up to Cleveland, uh, over to Keel, and then kind of all points in between, uh, in between there. So um, as Terry had mentioned, we're just starting our uh, second term, which means uh, we're just getting into, for the second time, our, uh, the, the state budget, and uh, which is really kind of a, a, an interesting process. Uh, maybe to, to back up so we can kind of talk a little bit about how the uh, budget is formulated. It's probably the, the biggest focal point, at least for the next six months. Um, the governor presents, comes up with a budget, and presents his budget to the legislature, uh, which he just did in a, a joint session with uh, uh, some remarks that he had uh, back at the beginning of February. Then now we're sort of <clears throat> in a little bit of an in-between time. We're waiting for uh, fiscal bureau, kind of our number crunchers and uh, policy people to go through the budget and come up with uh, policy papers and things like that for us to look at. And then once they get that all together, um, the Joint Finance Committee, which is made up equally of members from the Senate and uh, the Assembly, go around and have listening sessions on the, uh, the governor's budget and then start their process uh, of, of making changes, which we're all assigned uh, a budget buddy. Mine is uh, the co-chairman, uh, John Nigren. Uh, and we have regular meetings, and uh, that's how we can affect changes in the budget uh, through that that process <clears throat> through that process by submitting amendments to our budget buddy, and then he makes the case to the the rest of the the members on joint finance. At the end of the day, they come out with, <clears throat> geez, excuse me, um, they come out with kind of their final product, and then it's adopted by the assembly, uh, and then adopted by the senate separately, and then. <laughs> And, uh, and then the governor signs it and has some power to, to do a, a little bit of vetoes. But um, that being said, I was uh, asked to kind of talk about transportation a little bit because that's kind of been the uh, uh, kind of a hotly talked about uh, issue over the past uh, year and a half, two years. Uh, so the governor's budget uh, spends about $6 uh, billion on transportation uh, in infrastructure, roads, bridges, things like that, through a number of uh, various programs. And um, I guess what I would consider this, his budget proposal to be is one that's sort of focused on uh, local governments rather than uh, expanding and doing more uh, highway projects uh, or larger projects, what they call the, um, the, the uh, mega projects or the major projects uh, throughout the state. Um, he's... Uh, increase uh, local road aid programs called the, the LRIP program uh, by about $7 million each year. So over the course of the two-year biennium, about uh, $14 million more going into that program to help uh, local uh, road improvements, and then about uh, $6 million over the next two years in uh, the, the bridge improvement program. Um, and then uh, also uh, his budget doesn't delay the Majors program, which if you think of like it's the 441, Highway 10, Verona Road and Manitowoc, or uh, Madison, uh, I-3990, uh, uh, um, those projects stay on task, um, but then uh, some of the mega projects, which are the Southeast Wisconsin Zoo Interchange, things like that, uh, is set up to kind of see a little bit of, uh, of a delay. Um, also, kind of part of the, the governor's budget over the last couple of years, we've been having this discussion over uh, bonding or, or borrowing and things like that, and uh, how much is too much, what is the appropriate amount. We've been seeing the amount of bonding uh, as part of the transportation budget uh, going up and up, and it's kind of getting to that 20% uh, 20 uh, 20 point, uh, which uh, all kind of the fiscal bureau people and the number crunchers say is sort of the the tipping point where you want to keep it below about 20, uh, 25 percent. So that's certainly a concern I have is um, are we, you know, everybody takes on debt in their lives. You don't uh, typically pay cash for a house. You have a mortgage, car mortgages, things like that. But the bigger question is at what point are you too far extended and uh, when do we need to be ratcheting that back and actually be having a conversation about uh, paying for the projects that we're having rather than, uh, that, that we're doing rather than kind of uh, kicking the can down the road. Um, one of the things that you've been hearing 
talked about a little bit is um, this conversation about a gas tax increase, uh, vehicle registration fee increases, um, things like that. Uh, originally, the, the governor had said that he would not support a uh, gas tax increase or what we kind of call revenue uppers, I guess, if you hear that term, uh, for the transportation fund without an offset in uh, uh, a tax reduction somewhere else uh, in the budget. Um, part of uh, the budget process, the, the uh, we found out that we had. Sure. All right. Part of the that works a little better. Um, at least for now. Uh, that we found out that we will be ending this budget year with about uh, a seven hundred million dollars surplus. So um, our state revenues have outpaced what the projections were. So we'll actually be starting with uh, uh, in July first with a. About 700 uh, million more dollars, and one of the proposals that uh, uh, Speaker Voss in the Assembly said is, "Okay, well, let's do a 300 million dollar uh, tax cut, uh, in <coughs> income, property tax, something like that." But then also do 300 million dollars in whether it's nothing specific, but revenue uppers, gas tax registration, whatever. Um, and then the governor came back and said that he was not going to support. Uh, a tax increase. So that's kind of where we, we stand right now today on uh, the, the kind of state of our transportation <coughs> budget. One of the other things we did uh, in the last budget was uh, commission the Legislative Audit Bureau, which is a committee uh, made up again between the Republicans, Democrats, uh, Assembly and Senate that audits uh, all parts of state state government. Uh, so uh, part of the last budget was funding the Legislative Audit Bureau to do a comprehensive analysis of the transportation, uh, Wisconsin Department of Transportation, all of their programs. Um, and without going into um, too much detail, um, it, the audit found that there were uh, significant inconsistencies with uh, their own policies and, and procedures, um, things like there were about 360 projects that there was only one bidder on and they feel that they could have saved money by having more competitive bids. Um, again, found that uh, the, through the system that where they rate our highways, uh, the number of uh, percentage of highway that's considered good has dropped uh, from about 53% a few years ago to uh, now 41% being rated as good, um, but one of the most concerning things that you may have been hearing about is not correctly using uh, in inflation to <coughs> figure the, the uh, total costs of ongoing projects. So uh, they've estimated that um, there could be an extra uh, $3.1 billion of just in the projects that we kind of have in the pipeline that we haven't been working on that uh, have been kind of wrongly figured, I guess, uh, as part of their budget. And we've seen that locally with Highway 23 from when it was first uh, enumerated in 1999. Uh, it's gone up like 325%, I think, uh, the cost of the project. And it'll keep going up at the longer that it kind of sits out there. Which brings me to, um, also was asked to talk about the status of Highway 23. <coughs> you may see in the budget there was no money uh, allocated for Highway 23, and that's because of this ongoing lawsuit, uh, federal lawsuit, uh, that, that continues to be ongoing. So um, back in uh, May, when all the orange barrels were out there two years ago, and construction was supposed to start, uh, and uh, Judge Edelman, uh, federal court judge out of Milwaukee, said that he was uh, that he was putting a hold on the federal dollars in the project, which put a halt on the project. The state appealed. And uh, he um, upheld his decision. So since then, on November, uh, the begin uh, middle of November this past year, Wisconsin Department of Transportation appealed that decision to the uh, Sixth District Court uh, Appeals Court in Chicago. <coughs> One of the questions was uh, Wisconsin DOT was the uh, only entity uh, to file an appeal. 
Um, originally, uh, the, the lawsuit that was filed to, with, with Judge Edelman was, it was Wisconsin DOT, U.S. DOT, and FHWA, which is uh, the Federal, uh, Highway, uh, Federal Highways Administration. We're all in on that loss, lawsuit. The federal entities dropped out, so now it's just uh, WSDOT moving ahead um, with the lawsuit. So one of the questions that was raised was, well, do you have standing to bring a lawsuit because you're a state entity or agency? And um, according to DOT, they uh, f filed their motion with the court uh, in a timely fashion, and, are, and now we're in the process of waiting to, for the court to decide whether or not they have standing to bring uh, the lawsuit, and I just called over to DOT, and they're expecting to hear back. The uh, closest they could kind of get to the timeline was uh, spring 2017. So um, hopefully we get a couple more warmer days here, and spring comes a little faster, uh, faster than it, uh, sooner rather than later. But uh, that's the kind of the update on the court process. Without going into too much boring detail, because I've been going on way too long already. Devin usually keeps me honest on that. <coughs> Sorry, I'm struggling with my throat. Um, there, there's a whole process of when you do one of these construction projects, you have to fill a, a conform and follow what's called NEPA, which is a national environmental uh, protection. You have to file Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act standards, and then there's also something called WEPA, which is the Wisconsin Environmental uh, uh, Regulation. And in order to remove the federal dollars from the project, they would have to go back and amend the NEPA document and then re kind of make sure that the project conforms with all the WEPA, the Wisconsin uh, Environmental Protection Standards. So I've been trying to reach out to DOT. They just had a change in administration. Secretary Gottlieb left shortly before Christmas. Uh, and Secretary uh, Dave Ross just started here at the beginning of the year. So I've been trying to uh, reach out to them and figure out what uh, the hoops, hurdles, and everything is to go through and uh, try and go along with state funds, break it up over a couple budgets, just kind of get a little more creative to uh, you know, try and get things moving again. So there, there still have a few uh, holes in their, their legislative uh, um, people who work with the legislature and things like that. So um, we're waiting to get those filled and we'll be having those ongoing conversations. Um, I'll take a breath right there and pass it off to Devin uh, and then uh, we'll uh, answer some of the other questions that were on the list. Well, now that our time is up, thank you a lot. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Devin Lemieux. I represent uh, both of their assembly districts, plus one more up in the Manitowoc area, so my district pretty much runs from the Sheboygan County, Ozaki County line, up to the city of Manitowoc, over to Hilbert in Calumet County. So Tyler and I were actually in Calumet County this morning meeting with their county board members to hear uh, some of the issues that they were concerned about. Um, I think I'll start with a, just a little update from uh, what I worked on last session. Um, last session was as well my first uh, term in, well, in the middle of my first term in office, but two years ago I was elected with these, these two fine men. And uh, during the last session, I actually wrote 27 bills. Uh, 18 of them were passed into law, and 16 of those 18 had bipartisan support. So uh, it was an exciting uh, first two years. Worked on things from raffle reform to speed limit to online voter registration to cleaning up the voter rolls. Uh, worked on a bill for the district attorney, um, a lot of other great things. So it was, I thought it was a great year of learning and getting a lot done, and uh, a pretty good budget last year. Um, Starting this year, um, well, last year I chaired the Elections and Local Government Committee. This year it's been changed to Elections and Utilities, so I've entered the, uh, I was sitting back with some of the utility guys back there, they were growing me hard. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm the new, new, new Utilities is now a uh, committee that I'm chairing, so I've learned a lot about the, the whole um, energy production and distribution system over the last couple of months, so that's been exciting. And, um, well, maybe exciting is a little bit. For, for utilities, but <laughs> electrifying. <laughs> electrifying. <definitely. laughs> um, but uh, starting this session, uh, if you look at my bio, you can see some of the bills I'm already working on, and, and I was actually asked to talk about two of those. But before I begin, uh, Representative Katsuma and I actually had the first bill that was signed into law this session, Act One, uh, which was it allowing Oostburg to exceed their tip limits so that Masters Galleries can uh, expand into Oostburg, build a $30 million facility, and have new jobs, which is 
uh, very exciting for Oostburg and for Sheboygan County and Plymouth and, and the whole area, so that's great. Um, the two bills that they asked me to talk about, you can see some of the uh, bullet points on your on your sheet there on my bio, but uh, the first is the RAIDS Act. Um, this is a bill that's patterned after an idea from the federal government as well, and I worked on this last session. Um, my counterpart, the assembly, actually got it through the assembly house, and I failed to get it through the Senate. So, so giving another swing at it this session, what it essentially does is it brings legislative control back to the rulemaking process, especially expensive rules that have huge impacts on local governments, uh, taxpayers all around the state of Wisconsin. The way um, state government and federal government works is there's a lot of different bureaucracies, and they have the ability to write rules in certain areas, such as the DNR writing you know, commercial fishing um, limits, things like that. And when we pass a law, these agencies take our law and write rules around it to how our laws are enforced. Well, when the federal government passes a law such as the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, then it's the responsibility of, for instance, the DNR or different agencies to promulgate, make rules based on the federal law. An example of this was in 2008 when the Clean Water Act was passed. They made uh, rules, the state made rules, the state DNR made rules about how water um, treatment plants, the quality of water that can be put back into to our water system. And what the state DNR did was they went way above and beyond what the federal government actually required. And the way the system is currently set up, there was never actually a vote taken on this because the only way we can stop a rule is to pass a law sub over subverting that rule. So what the bill actually does, the way we have it written now, is that if there's a rule that's going to cost over $10 million over a two-year period to um, small businesses, uh, levels of government, things like that, that us as legislators who represent you actually have to take an affirmative vote to pass that rule to make sure that it's in line with what the intention is of the government and things like that. So I think it's a very important thing to give legislative oversight to especially things that have huge impacts on uh, local ratepayers for uh, water, uh, sewer, things like that. Um, so we're excited about it. The governor actually put it in the budget as well. Um, his version is a little different than, than my version. Obviously, I think my version is a better version. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, so we're, we're very hopeful that, that, that this can get done this session to make sure that uh, we're, we're stopping harmful regulations from getting passed on from unelected uh, government officials. And uh, the second uh, bill that I was asked to talk about is the Second Start Act. Um, this was also another bill that was introduced last session by the late Senator Rick Mudex. And um, it was released at the end of the session, so it didn't get time to get done. But what it does is it deals with the skills gap a little bit. If all of you manufacturers out there know that, it, and business owners know that, it's sometimes really hard in this economy right now to find employees, especially in some of the skilled trade areas. Uh, so what this bill does is it takes um, students who do not finish their traditional four-year UW education and it allows the Department of Workforce Development to uh, essentially market these, these students for other job opportunities in the area, or career opportunities in the area that they live, such as apprenticeships, uh, LTC, um, nursing opportunities, things like that, because what, what especially the, uh, the skilled trades found is that if someone doesn't finish their traditional four-year education. It's usually not until they're 28, 29 years old until they actually find an apprenticeship, so they almost lose a whole decade of their life when they're you know, working at Walmart or Culver's or whatever, trying to figure out what to do with their life. So this way it gives them an opportunity to uh, see well, there's opportunities in welding at LTC or uh, electricians or nursing, so that, to help these students find the right paths in their life. So with, uh, it's, Gotten a lot of good uh, publicity already, and we're very hopeful that we can uh, can get that done. But uh, with that, those were the two things that I was asked to talk about. We can turn it over to the list of questions. Could I comment? There's blue books in the back. If they're not already, they're gone. Okay, good. There's some maps. Probably in the past you used a paper map. Nobody uses that anymore. Maybe give it to your kids or your grandkids. They can color on it. There's also a sign-up sheet uh, if you're interested in receiving my e-update. I appreciate that. I want to just give a shout-out to the chamber, the county chamber, who has been very active in these ozone non-attainment. And I didn't really know much about that uh, until...
until I was serving in this position, but just to summarize, Sheboygan County and half of Kenosha County is found to be in non-attainment. And it's because we have this ozone monitoring station at the edge of Col at Colorandry Park, like about 50 feet from Lake Michigan, and that is monitoring ozone, and a lot, it's coming up, it's transport ozone that comes up from Illinois and Indiana. And because of that, our whole entire county is found to be in non-attainment. And this is a big deal because this has an effect on our economy, on businesses that, that want to expand. We've had reports of folks that have not <coughs> expanded in the county. They've expanded out of state. We've, we hear reports of folks that want to move to, to Sheboygan County and then they, they go on the website and, and look up uh, uh, American Lung Association and find out that Sheboygan has bad air. And did you all know that, that Sheboygan had bad air? And so the problem is the federal EPA regulations prevent us from moving that monitoring site at Colorado. A couple years ago, there was a new site that was uh, down on Highway 42 in, near Haven that is reporting below ozone levels. So, and, and thanks to the work of Alliant and many, many, many other companies in the county that are working hard to produce clean air, we could have all the companies closed down and all the cars out of the county, and we would still be in non-attainment because of the ozone that comes up over the lake. So just. A couple of weeks ago, a few of us were in Milwaukee meeting with Senator Johnson's office. Uh, they're, they've been very active on this, along with, with Congressman Grothman. They understand the urgency of this matter, and I want to give my hat to, to Jane and to Betsy. And, and so, just so you know, you're, when you you know when you write down that check for your chamber dues, that's one of the good things among many that they do. But but uh, so thank you for your emphasis and your work on that. So. Do you want to moderate, uh, moderate these questions, or are you going to let us moderate the questions? Well, actually, actually, I have two questions oh, for you. Okay. Actually, I have two questions, and then we'll take questions from the audience. If you, anybody who's writing them down, I'll come around and pick them up in between the answers here. Uh, gentlemen, recently the governor suggested reviewing the law that requires public school districts to start their year no sooner than September 1st. Understanding what this means to the tourism industry, and I have to say also to the education uh, of our students because we have some educators in the audience. Do you believe that this is a local decision that should be given to the local school, school boards based on the needs of their district and in their community? One thing I've learned being in the legislature, every issue is local control. Should there be local control? Should there be state standards so that's the same rule throughout the state? And every, every, every decision comes down to that. And um, so the arguments from the educators are that we, we need to start early because the kids are there anyway doing volleyball and football and, and we need the, those extra uh, time to, for AP and for academic reasons and it should be left up to the local school district and then you have the tourism industry and I, I used to think it was because they needed those workers but their argument is for family vacations and, and the water temperature of all these inland lakes in Wisconsin in June is much colder than what it is in, in August so, so it's important that we don't cut into that and, and uh, but one of the, the largest opponents of changing it is, is uh, Senator Luther Olson, who represents the Wisconsin Dells area and is chair of the Education Committee. So uh, whatever I think um, may not make a big difference because it's going to be uh, up to him. You know, th this is an issue that uh, has kind of come up the last uh, few years in different forms. Last year there was a bill to uh, allow for school or high, high schools or school districts who had a certain number of kids in advanced placement courses and things like that uh, to start earlier um, to, to try and get around it. Um, I really am 
conflicted and uh, trying to learn from both the education and the tourism folks. I've been uh, talked to a lot by the folks at the Elkhart Lake Chamber and the Plymouth Chamber uh, about uh, the impact that tourism has on uh, their communities. Um, and so I, I guess I'm, I'm still trying to do my, my due diligence and figure out what is the best option for the area. Um, I tend to lean a little closer to letting uh, uh, the, the local school boards decide, but um, but like I said, I, uh, this is something I'm really, really, you know, I know it had, does have a big impact on this area and really want to be sensitive to, to that fact as well. I lean towards local control as well. I, talking to the superintendents in the area, most of them just want to start the, the Monday before Labor Day. As you can imagine, Labor Day moves every year. It's not the same day every year. So every year you're starting calendars <coughs> different every year. And I think all the, all they want to do, is, especially in this area, is just start on that Monday before and then actually provide a longer weekend over a <coughs> day weekend, which would provide more opportunities for family vacations um, or going to the fair or things like that. So um, I do uh, understand a little bit the concerns of the, uh, of the tourism industry, but I, I, I'm going to need to see some more evidence from it. But like, these two guys said it's, oh, maybe someday we'll find a compromise and it can be the Monday before Labor Day rather than September 1st because I think that would, I think that might make everyone happy, but not, people don't always like to compromise. I have another question for you. I have one more question and then we have some questions from the audience and I'll warn you, gentlemen, that they're coming from the county commissioners. <laughs> <laughs> um, how does what's happening in Washington, D.C. impact us at the state level? It has a huge impact. The, the state budget, I, I've grown to learn, a third of the state budget comes from the federal government. So, and, and I think it's the Department of Workforce Development, 60% of their budget comes from federal dollars. So when we, when we get these federal dollars, of course, they set strings and, and set requirements on that. Uh, and, and, but as I said before, this whole federalism, are we, gonna, are we gonna see more go to the states? But I think in a way that's kind of a pipe dream because uh, when people have power, they don't want to give it up. And, and so, um, um, but, but uh, it's a big deal. Um, so this is kind of the third uh, item that I, I wanted to talk about. Um, so we had, had the speaker created a new committee that we didn't have in the assembly last session, uh, calling it the Federalism and Interstate Relations Committee, with the thought being with, uh, with a new administration and a Congress who had their leadership uh, have all said that they support devolving, giving some power back to the state, whether it's block granting Medicaid, um, <coughs> loosening strings and other programs, things like that, is to work with and kind of be on the front end uh, of that whole process. I was actually just out in uh, Ohio last Thursday, um, myself and a few other speaker boss and uh, Mike Roarcast who works, did some of the aging and, or the Alzheimer's and dementia stuff. Um, the, the Speaker Voss and Speaker Cliff Rosenberger from Ohio have a really good working relationship and we went out to meet with some of their folks and I met with um, Representative uh, Rogner who's the Ohio chair of the newly created Federalism and Interstate Relations Committee in Ohio. Um, and actually we just sent today to the Wall Street Journal and I brought copies and op-ed of the things we're trying to do, uh, a little bit of uh, primer on what federalism is and kind of a call to action for the other 50 states to, to join us in uh, having this conversation and continuing to push for more of that uh, the, uh, power to, to come back to Washington because when you think about it, uh, think about your history lesson. Uh, we originally were under the Articles of Confederation which wasn't working very well and then what happened when they wanted to make a change they decided to send representatives from Virginia and representatives from Maryland to go and come up with the great compromise that we now have as the US Constitution and throughout the last century or so particularly with lawsuits um, disrupting the Tenth Amendment and uh, you know the uh, um, 
very commerce clauses and um, uh, things like that, we've seen a lot stronger uh, central government than I think was uh, initially uh, in power. You know, we were, were considered the laboratories of democracy. So um, I'm really, if you can't tell, I'm really geeked out about this and. Uh, um, and just, uh, I think it's a great opportunity and one that uh, we don't want to uh, squander. We all don't need to talk on every question, do we? <laughs> Especially when Tyler talks for like five minutes, <laughs> six minutes on the topic. Just so excited. <laughs> well, Devin, take the next question. Mm -hmm. You can have all the rest. <laughs> <laughs> Questions from the <laughs> oh, uh, Where's the question? I made a speech. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you want to respond to it? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. I really, this Highway 23, we talked about it. That's my issue. I was going to say something similar just to, to give some love back because you were very nice and complimentary of the chamber, and I think everyone in this room feels that. Our White County Chamber is second to none. In the gala that was just held, bringing the whole community together is wonderful. So appreciated those remarks, Terry. And I was going to share something similar to Tom, that I, I'm just so proud of our area representatives, and thank you all for your leadership. If you're new to this group, and I do know we have at least one person in the audience who hadn't been to a Friday Forum before, uh, Senator Lemieux was a former county board supervisor, as was his father, Dan. And his father, Dan, and former Chairman Roger Mastrudy, hired me, so I'm very grateful for that. You can respond to that. <laughs> so I'm still disappointed in his voice. Terry Kotsma and I used to play racquetball together, and uh, don't let that smile fool you. He is one tough competitor. And then Tyler, li living in Plymouth and a Plymouth High School grad, uh, has a wonderful family. In fact, his better half now works for the Sheboygan County Health and Human Services Department. So we've got some good people here. They're always good about attending legislative breakfasts and communicating with us. The key thing that Tom and I wanted to share today, and I do have a question, Highway 23, um, 
1999, when it was enumerated or approved, it was about a $42 million project or so estimated. And today it's over $140 million. There'll be a letter, letter to the editor from German Wagner and I this weekend raising attention to it and encouraging all of us to support their leadership to bring more attention to this. And personally, though the lawsuit has slowed progress, when you have the kind of resources that we have in the state, state funds, whether they're general funds, segregated funds, or bonding, we don't have to rely on federal funds to complete the work on Highway 23. And every year that it's delayed, that cost just goes up and up to the point where you wonder, is it worth waiting for the federal funds? Or are we all as taxpayers going to end up spending more to get the job done to begin with? So there will be a letter out there. And for those of us involved, and I know the Chamber's been involved, Kohler Company, Sargento Company, there are a lot of really important companies and people in this community behind seeing 23 get done. We encourage you to push that envelope. So the question is, the governor has taken a point of view where he doesn't want to raise any revenue, and none of us like to see taxes increased. But when you see the kind of data that's been produced now on the shape of our roads, the escalating costs to catch up, what's all been playing out, what can you do, what can the legislature do to bring this to some type of compromise and action to problem solve, rather than the ongoing excuses, whether it's a lawsuit or whatever. I think what this community is looking from our friends and, and area representatives is what can you specifically do to help move this forward to get Highway 23 done and make sure that we get <coughs> some new transportation funds in the works to be sure we're being fiscally responsible and taking care of our investment, our transportation system. Here's where we defer to our senator. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pass the microphone. Yeah, we're, to whether we could do it right now with just state funds, um, I think we first need to wait, at least through the federal appeal court process. But it's going to be interesting since there's already been federal money spent on the project. So uh, if we have to pay that back, I mean, we're going to need to get all those answers before we could actually just start building it with just state funds. And to put in perspective how much that federal funding is, it's about a quarter of the cost. That'd be about an extra $35 million that the state would bear if we would do it all ourselves. Actually, it's going to be closer to $40 million by the time we get around to it. $40 million just in, in extra state funds if we don't have any federal funds. So um, hopefully we get a hear back from the Federal Court of Appeals in the next uh, couple months, and uh, then we can go from there. But um, when funds are tight already, trying to convince uh, 17 other senators and 49 other assemblymen to overpay ahead of time, well, your transportation project is in the court system and surpass maybe what they want done in their own district would be a pretty daunting task since this speaker, he probably sat with the speaker, probably mentioned 94 or whatever the heck he wants. Um, expanded down there. You said Amy Laudenbeck was on there. She wants 39 expanded down there. So it's, you know, it's all part of prioritizing between the, the different projects. And when your project is tied up in the court system, uh, we have to to wait until it gets through the process. Is, is my point of view. Um, overall transportation funding. Um, the the governor's budget proposal adds three billion dollars of, of spending across the board. Not, on the transportation across the board. And um, uh, since I haven't commented on this budget proposal yet today, um, I, there's a lot of spending in areas and some tax cuts, which if I was governor, that wouldn't have been my proposal. So I think we're a long ways away from, from the final product. I don't think either house is going to be happy with having $500 million um, still being bonded in transportation. So. So I think we're a long ways from the process, but um, um, I think I think we can still find a lot of savings in, in transportation. Um, when you hear them testifying that they ripped up an entire lanes of road around Madison when the pavement was only 20 years old with a 50-year lifespan, I mean that's that's a waste of money. Are we prioritizing right? There's there's a lot of stuff in that. 
Devin's right. There are um, the audit did identify a number of things that uh, significant savings that we could see. It's not gonna solve the problem, but um, again, in order, my my kind of default position is if I'm going to ask other people to, to uh, pay more in gas tax, we want to make sure uh, we're being as efficient as possible. So I think we'll, we'll, we will and we'll need to address some of those things. Um, there's also things that we can be doing to spend better, um, do federal state uh, swaps so that we kind of put all the federal dollars into one project because they're, uh, even though um, we got rid of uh, prevailing wage uh, in Wisconsin last session, there's still the federal Davis-Bacon uh, rule where if there's any federal dollars spent, it's subject to a federal uh, prevailing wage requirement. So you can kind of sort of get around that by putting all the fed federal money into one big project in you know Milwaukee or something like that and then uh, use states. Otherwise, there's communities who I think it was Muskego uh, did four miles of road and two were through a grant with federal dollars. So like the two mile section that was paid, paid with federal dollars was like millions of dollars more than the one same stretch of road, just you know, different uh, percentages or whatever, uh, paid a lot less for the state portion. So there's things like that that uh, we're also going to be uh, looking at and doing to, to be more efficient with the money that we do have. I just want to comment that it was previously stated the governor's budget last time for transportation it was about 20% of the total revenue was to go to debt service, principal and interest payments. And that has been steadily climbing, and that's not sustainable. So, but overall, the, the governor's proposal in, in other parts of the budget is the least amount of borrowing. So the, the trend is down for total state borrowing. Betsy, Michelle. I, I have a slightly different question. Um, I'm wondering about the allocations. I mean, are, is there a reason that our Highway 23 can't be named? I mean, in, in view of the fact that the lawsuit announcement may be made in the spring, is there room to put it back in if that announcement is what we want to hear? Yes, that, yes, and, but that announcement is just, that announcement's just whether or not saying the Department of Transportation has standing to bring the lawsuit, then they still have to make their arguments, uh, uh, you know, make, make their uh, argument for the lawsuit. So then that's another uh, chunk of time. But th there is, uh, especially if it is done in March or April, there is still time to get things in there. This, this is a two-year budget, so to, to not have it in there is right, a good reason if, to shove it aside again. Right. But if you were the governor and you didn't live in Sheboygan or Manitowoc, would you put in a project when you're delaying other projects that is held up in court? If it's a project that's been on the books for since 1999. A lot of these projects have been in the works for a long time. See, I didn't know that. I thought they were more recent than ours. Some of them are. Other questions? In the initial hearing last fall, they did use the new updated uh, traffic projections that the DOT.
DOT did. Um, so yes, that the uh, I'm trying to think of what the do you remember what? Can you shed it? some light on this? Was it the traffic study? Yeah. Yeah. So part of what Judge Edelman had asked was that uh, there be current traffic counts done. Uh, as part of the lawsuit. I, I hadn't heard about it being used for uh, opening up and revising uh, the NEPA document. Um, maybe we can talk a little more offline about that. But, um, but in general, um, they found, DOT found that their traffic counts were uh, slightly less than what they had projected what, 16 years ago or, or whatever, um, but they then they studied uh, five different alternatives, um, doing nothing, full four-lane expansion, uh, and then two studies with um, passing lanes, uh, two lane for most of it, and then adding those, you know, kind of passing lanes for a couple of miles. And they figured that going full four lanes would reduce uh, a drive time from Plymouth to Fond du Lac by five minutes. All the other ones were like negligible in less than a minute. Um, the, it, it incorporated the safety metrics that it was safer to do it that way. Um, and uh, I think that was, those were kind of the three, uh, the, the kind of three big points that they made. But it was my impression that it was for the lawsuit, not, not for the NEPA. Can I just comment on the budget? The budget the last session it was 74 billion over two years. The budget this session is 76 billion over two years. The governor proposed uh, $200 per child increase in, in K-12 public education and $205 the second year for the biennium. Uh, we one of the standing meetings we meet with is with our superintendents from the county. And some of the feedback we've heard from them, we of course have several very efficient, low spending districts here in the eastern in Sheboygan County. And so the, the argument is, is should everybody get an across the board uh, raise, uh, which doesn't reward those in our community that have been efficient. So that is going to be in, uh, a point of contention or a point of debate with the, the governor's budget. One maybe closing thought, I think we're kind of getting to the hour. Um, just wanted to say thank you all for coming and listening to us. And uh, If there's anything we can do, don't f feel free to make sure you call, email our office. We're happy to meet uh, in district. We're setting up some uh, listening sessions on the budget coming up, uh, I think starting next two weeks from now. Um, so watch our e-updates and things for that. Um, but one thing I just wanted to mention because it was on the list and we didn't get to it was uh, the manufacturing and egg tax credit. Um, because it has been getting some, um, uh, there's been some articles kind of calling into question uh, the, the program. Um, I wasn't in office when it was first passed in, uh, in like 2011, I think. Uh, but anecdotally, what it's done for this community being so manufacturing intensive, if you think back to 2010 as we were sort of coming out of the 2008 recession, we were dealing with uh, situations like Mercury Marine, and Fond du Lac threatening to leave and go to Oklahoma and take you know hundreds of jobs there, um, and other kind of individual uh, companies saying, well, we're going to leave unless you know we get some sort of tax package. Um, the, the discussions I remember at the time was the manufacturing and aid tax credit was designed to uh, lower the tax burden on all manufacturers so that we didn't have to pick winners and losers. We were just saying if you're going to invest and be here uh, and support jobs in Wisconsin, uh, we want to help you with that, not just because you're threatening to leave or things like that. So um, I think, especially for Sheboygan County and the, the surrounding area, the companies that uh, do qualify for it and use it uh, has just been a, a, a boon or to, to our economy. Um, we've seen even, you know, Mercury Marine has added jobs over in Fond du Lac since then, and um, I mean, I think it is an important thing uh, for, for this area, especially. I was going to talk about the main tax <laughs> Before it was put into effect in uh, 2011, 81,000 jobs were lost in manufacturing. Since it went into effect, 34,000 jobs have been added to manufacturing. Um, 
as uh, Al can tell you, Congressman Grothman is in the highest percentage of manufacturing congressional district in the country. In the country, it's congressional district. So it's in what's probably second year is agriculture. And what actually makes this area very special is a combination of agriculture and manufacturing. We do process food manufacturing. So the uh, manufacturing and the A tax credit is so vitally important to, to our district. So I don't, we just had that as a point on there. So I don't know if someone had a question about it or if they were wondering if they're going to get rid of it. But uh, it's not going anywhere. I just wanted to comment on that credit as well. One of the committees I serve on is Ways and Means. And we had a, a hearing as, uh, where a non-biased economics professor from Madison was doing a study and compared along the border counties uh, employment in, in Wisconsin versus Minnesota and in Illinois and Iowa and he attributed part of the improvement in Wisconsin is due to the major, uh, manufacturing and agricultural credits. So even just a day or two ago uh, a, a bill came out to eliminate that. So um, we still got to continue that fight to maintain that. Senator Lemieux, Representative Katzma, Representative Borpick, Bor thank you very much for being with us here today. We appreciate your coming, and of course, we appreciate your service too. Thank you very much. Thank you.